Hello. In this video, I want to discuss the concepts of limit and continuity, but for vector functions. So first, let's ask the questions. Why should we consider limits? Well, we like to think of the range of a vector function as a curve, either in R2 or in R3, depending on whether or not it's a three or a two-dimensional vector function. So in other words, if we have a function i, r defined on an interval i into say r3 then we look at the set of possible values of this vector function t in i and in, well in this case that will be in r3 and we like to think of this as a curve but for some vector functions the range doesn't does not look like anything we would consider a curve right so one can, def can construct vector functions that just give you sort of a infinitely many discrete little dots and that's not a curve and the second and very important reason for dis for discussing limits is differentiation right if you want to do calculus then you need to be able to talk about limits and continuity and things like that right so why differentiation well um, if you have some vector function r and let's say it's defined on the positive reals into r3 Right. And let's say at each time t, r of t gives you the position of a particle. So you have some small particle moving around in space and r of t gives its position. And this position is relative to some reference point which is the origin. Then the velocity, right? and we know velocity is derivative of of this position. Right. And this is a fundamental interpretation of vector functions as giving position of moving objects and the derivative is in velocity. Right. So we need to develop limits so we can talk about derivatives. So let's see, what's the definition of a limit of a vector function? Well, we're essentially mimicking the definition of a limit for a function from R to R. Right, so we have some vector function r, and it's defined on an open interval containing a real number a, except possibly at a, so it's not necessary for the function to be defined at a. Now the limit of this vector function right, is supposed to be some vector in R3. Right? If this is a three-dimensional vector function, in the case of a two-dimensional vector function, the limit would be in R2. Right? So what do we mean when we say for this vector c, that the limit as t goes to a of r of t is c. Well, like I said, we mimic the definition for the limit of a function from r to r. Right? And it's formally exactly the same. For every epsilon, there exists a delta bigger than zero, so that if absolute value of t minus a is between zero and delta, then norm of r of t minus c is less than epsilon. Right. So you see, this is exactly like the definition for a limit of a scalar function, except that here we have the norm, right? Because we're dealing with vectors instead of numbers, so we can't use absolute value. Right. So let's see. Right. Let's draw a little picture. Right. So for every epsilon positive, right, and that epsilon. That measures distance from the point C. Right? So we want the distance between R of C, uh, R of T and C to be less than epsilon. Right? So distance R of T minus C less than epsilon, what does that mean? It means R of T is in the circle we've drawn here. Right, circle with center C radius epsilon. Right? And the definition says, well, no matter how small we take this epsilon, right, we can get R of T inside that circle if we just take a small enough interval around A. That's where the delta comes in. Delta tells you how close should T be to A so that R of T sits in the circle. Right? So the definition says, We've got our epsilon, we can find the delta, so no matter which t we take in here, as long as it's not a, 
R is going to take this T and send it in there to some point inside the circle, R of T. Right. That's the definition. Now, there is very good news. So if we look at this picture, right, and this is a two-dimensional picture, right, and let's say we take R of T, and we write it out component-wise, X of T, Y of T. Right? Now, so there's C, so its components are going to sit there, C1. and C2. Right. So now the fact that R of T sits inside the circle, right? if we drop down the components of R of T, right? X of T is going to sit there, Y of T is going to sit there. Now how close is X of T to C1 and how close is Y of T to C2? Well, if we just drop down the ball here, the circle there, and there, right, you'll see, well, here, we're going a direction epsilon from C in the x direction. Right, so, we go to C1 minus epsilon, and there we go to C1 plus epsilon. So, we see that if T sits between A minus delta and A plus delta. Then X of T sits between C1 minus epsilon and C1 plus epsilon. And likewise for the Y component. Right, we're going to sit between C2 minus epsilon and C2 plus epsilon. Right? So that tells us that the fact that this limit, T goes to A, of R of T is C gives us that the components go along, right? So the first component of R goes to the first component of C and the second component of R goes to the second component of C. Right. That's good news because it tells us that when we're dealing with limits of vector functions we can actually take everything down to the level of the components. And that's what this next theorem tells us. Right? If we have a vector function R. Its components are x, y, and z. So this is a three-dimensional vector function. And it's defined on some open interval containing A, except possibly at A. Right? Now, if we have a vector C with C1, C2, and C3, its components, then the limit as t goes to A of R of t is this vector C, if and only if. Right? The limit as T goes to A of X of T is C1. So the first component of R of T goes to the first component of C. Limit of Y of T as T goes to A C2. So second component of R of T goes to second component of C. And limit of T goes to A Z of T is C3. So third component of R of T goes to third component of C. And this is if and only if, which means the two things are exactly the same. So saying limit t goes to a of r of t is vector c is exactly the same as saying that the three component limits behave in this way. Right? So limit x of t is c1, limit y of t is c2, and limit z of t is c3. So that means Whenever we have to deal with the limit of a vector function, we can take it down to the limit to the level of the components, which means we can use everything we know about limits of R to R functions. Right? These are all functions R to R. Right? We can use everything we know about limits of functions from R to R and apply them to limit to limits of vector functions by going to the components. Right? And we'll see a couple of demonstrations of this. <coughs> right. So, of course, once you've defined limit, the next thing you need to define is continuity. Right? And of course, the definition of continuity for vector functions is exactly the same as the definition for, for, for continuity of functions from R to R. Right? A vector function R 
defined on an open interval containing A, and now it must also be con defined at A, is continuous at A if limit T goes to A, if R of T is R of A. Right? That's a no the normal definition of continuity. And using our theorem that relates the limit of the vector function R to the limit of its components, right, we now get immediately the following result. Our vector function R will be continuous at A if and only if the three component functions are continuous at A. Right. So that's the first example of how the fact that the limit of a vector function is determined by the limits of its components is used. Right? It tells us that a vector function is continuous precisely when its component functions are continuous. And um, we'll at a and in the next video we'll look at how we use our theorem about component-wise limits to prove some things about limits of vector functions.